welcome tonight. I'm delighted that each of you are back with us and watching. Just a few minutes ago, I was on the telephone with Pastor Michael Wumpa from the Democratic, Repub De Democratic Republic of Congo, and uh, he was sharing with me the miracles of God in Congo and how last Sabbath they baptized 515 people. And he said, you know, this Sabbath, it's going to be much greater. We already have over 670 that they're preparing for baptism. And he was telling me about the meetings and how thrilled he was that the Spirit of God was working. Let's greet the Congo tonight, Democratic Republic of the Congo. We are so delighted that you're watching there. Some of you are watching in fields, some of you in churches and various places. But let's go to... Uh, Matwapa, a uh, central church in Mombasa. They set up a screen at a bus stop, and they have 20 to 100 people every day at the bus stop, and many of them of different faiths are preparing for baptism. Let's welcome Mombasa at the bus stop. Those of you at the bus stop, praise God. If you have to miss your bus, stay for this meeting because God is going to speak to your hearts. Now, here's an interesting story. In uh, Tangaren, in West Kenya Union, a non-Adventist church pastor has made his decision with his son to follow the truth by being baptized and joining the Seventh-day Adventist church. Pastor, that has taken real courage for you. And if you're watching tonight, I commend you. God, I know, will use you to guide your former congregation to make the decision that you have made. You know, pastors hearing the word of God that are not Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath-keeping pastors are stepping out to follow Jesus. So are Catholic brothers. Now, you know, in the Catholic Church, the brotherhood are teachers. They're Catholic teachers. Here are three Catholic teachers or brothers. They had made a vow never to join the Seventh Avenue Church. That's a dangerous vow to make because the Spirit of God spoke to their heart in a, in, in a river in Magori. They just were baptized last Sabbath. Now these brothers will be teaching the truth of God's word. Let's welcome the brothers from Magari. We praise God for your courage. A, a, a non-Adventist pastor steps out. Catholic brothers are stepping out. People from all walks of life and faith are making their decision to follow Jesus. Now some of you have been following the tragic civil war in the country of the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And one of the large camps for people that are displaced is in Gomer. It's a place that's quite poverty stricken. And if any place needs hope, it is this refugee camp in Gomer. And I want to show you a picture that when I saw it tonight really touched my heart. They have erected a tent there and these people are sitting on logs, sitting on rocks and seats, but every night they're coming to this tent in this refugee camp, maybe a little uncomfortable because of the rocks, maybe a little uncomfortable because of the logs, but they want hope in their lives. I want to speak directly to you tonight who are there in Gomer, in the Bolingo refugee camp, Christ is something better for you. He will fill your heart with joy tonight. He'll touch you with peace tonight. But he will give you hope, hope that beyond the poverty of that camp, hope beyond the sickness and suffering of that camp, that Jesus Christ is going to come again, and there'll be a day when there'll be no more sickness or suffering or heartache or sorrow. We will be praying for you that God will give you a vision of his love and grace. You'll sense that you're not alone. You'll sense that you have brothers and sisters around the world that know your plight and that are praying for you. Now, with the help of the Adventist Church 
in the Centro Kivu field, many, many are being prepared for baptism this coming Sabbath. The miracles of God's grace are just amazing. When we see what God is doing around the world, when we see what he's doing here in Africa, we sense that we are living at a time when the Holy Spirit is being poured out and Jesus is touching hearts. Let's pray. Father, we've prayed a number of times in this meeting, but there's never a time when we can sense that we do not need your grace through prayer. And tonight we're going to be studying about hope in death. Not only hope in death, but how we can find peace when a loved one has died. There are people here tonight that have lost a husband or wife, a brother, a sister, a son or daughter, family member, maybe in COVID, maybe in an accident, maybe in murder. Lord, give them courage tonight. There are many refugees watching that they are, some are orphans. Help them to know your love and grace. And there are many that are confused about the subject of death. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them tonight and help us to clear up that subject and see that Christ is our only hope. In Jesus' name, amen. Where can we find hope that goes beyond the grave? Is there a hope that takes us beyond death? And what really happens when you die? There are many different theories about death. And if you went out and asked five different people in Nairobi, what happens when you die? Some of them might say, well, when you die, you immediately go to heaven. Or if you're not good, you go to hell. Some people would say that. Other people would say, well, when you die, that's the end of the road. You go into the grave, and that's it. Other people would say, when you die, why, maybe you're reincarnated, and you come back to another life. People have different ideas about death. But are the dead asleep, waiting for the resurrection when Jesus comes? Or as some teach, are they in heaven already? Is the soul immortal? Do we have within us an immortal soul that simply when we die, leaves the body? Now, have you ever been to a funeral and the pastor says at the funeral, oh, Aunt Sally or Uncle James is looking down at you now from heaven. But then a little later in the sermon, he says, when, there'll be a day when Jesus comes and Uncle James will be resurrected. And you're sitting there scratching your head saying, if Uncle James is up in heaven, uh, how's he gonna be resurrected? So there's a lot of confusion about this subject of death. And so we ask the question, where can we find answers? Answers that touch our hearts, answers that satisfy our minds, answers that give us hope for death. There's only one place that we can find answers, not in human opinions, not in what men and women teach or say. There's only one place we can find answers. Where is that place, everybody, that we can find answers? That place is in the Word of God, not human tradition, not human logic, not what various religions teach or do not teach, but the Bible is a, sure, is a sure guide in this matter. In the book of Revelation, in the first chapter, God gives us hope in death because in Revelation chapter 1, the Bible describes Jesus. Now, there's one thing that you read in the book of Revelation and throughout the Bible. Jesus has never lost a battle with death. Every time Jesus meets death, Jesus is victorious and the dead are resurrected. Why? In Revelation, John writes in Revelation 1 verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, are men, and I have the keys of Hades, that's the grave and death. So what does this text tell us? It tells us that Jesus went into the tomb 
and he came out in his resurrected body and conquered the tomb. So because Jesus conquered the tomb, we need not fear death. Jesus says, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of the grave and of death. Have you lost a wife by death? Has a husband died of a heart attack? Have you found your husband murdered one day? Have you lost a, child, a child through some childhood disease? As difficult as that is, as heartbreaking as that is, there is one who holds the keys to death, and that one is Jesus Christ. So we can face death in the arms of Jesus. We can know that one day Jesus will come again. But we still have some questions. And the questions are, what does the Bible teach about this idea of the immortal soul? Do we have an immortal soul that kind of wings its way to heaven after we die, or, or a soul that goes to, to hell? Or what does the Bible actually teach about the soul? If you want to learn what the Bible teaches about death, you have to go back to creation, because death is just creation in reverse. So let's go back to the book of Genesis, where God actually created the world. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So the Bible says God formed man, that he's formed his body, out of the dust of the ground. Then it says God breathed into man the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. So if we were going to do a mathematical formula of this, we would say dust plus spirit equals a living soul. Or we might put it this way, the elements of earth plus the breath of God equals a living being. So God creates man out of the dust of the ground, breathes his spirit into man, and man becomes a living soul or a living being. The Bible does not say that God put a soul in the human being. Man is a living soul. Another word for soul is person or being. So body plus breath equals a living soul or a living what, everybody? A living soul or a living what? Being or a living person. A living soul simply means a living person. You know, in the United States, uh, we use the soul, if, if, let's suppose my wife goes shopping, and I'm expecting her home in an hour or an hour and a half, but she comes home in about 45 minutes, and I say, wow, darling, you are home early. Why are you home so early? And she said, I went to shopping and there was not a soul there. I'm, I'm, woo, all these disembodied spirits. Is that what she meant when she says there's not a soul there? What did she mean? There's not a what? Not a person there. So we use that term. In fact, do you know the Bible uses that term? The Apostle Paul in the book of Acts is talking about a boat that he's traveling on on his way to Rome, and he says there were 276 souls on the boat. What did Paul mean in Acts when he said there were 276 souls on the boat? What did he mean, everybody? 276 what? People. So the soul in the Bible is not something God puts into human beings. The soul is the product of what we are. The body plus the breath equals a living soul. Now, sometimes in the Bible, the Bible talks about the soul being life. Remember when Jesus said, fear not him who can destroy uh, your body, but who can destroy your soul or your total life in the fires of hell. So that asked, then we ask the question. Another name for soul in the Bible is a person or a life, but that leads us to the question, what is this soul? Is it immortal? Can the soul ever die? The Bible is very clear. Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 4, the soul who sins shall die. Can you repeat that text with me in Ezekiel 18 4? The soul that sins shall die. Once again, the soul 
that sins shall die. So can the soul die according to the Bible? Yes, sir. What is the soul? It's the product of breath and body. The soul is a living person. So you could read the text, the person who sins shall die. Now the Bible uses the term soul 1,600 times. That's in the King James Version of the Bible. How many times does the Bible use the word soul, everybody? How many? 1,600 times. How many times does the Bible use the term immortal soul? Not once. So you would think if the soul were immortal, that is, if the soul could never die, and the Bible uses the term soul 1,600 times, you would think that the Bible would use that term immortal soul at least once, but it doesn't. The Bible never speaks about human beings in their present condition as immortal. For example, in Job 4, verse 17, the Bible says, shall mortal man be more just than his maker? We are mortal, subject to disease, subject to death. In Romans chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, it says, we seek for immortality. So if human beings are mortal, and if we're seeking for immortality, when do we receive immortality? 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 and 52 says, this mortal shall put on immortality when Christ comes. Three texts to put together. Job 4, verse 17, shall mortal man be more just than his maker. We are mortal. We are subject to disease and death. Uh, Romans 2, 7 and 8, we seek for immortality. When do we receive immortality? 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, when Jesus comes. Now, does the Bible ever use the term immortality, and who has it? There's no such thing in the Bible as the immortal soul. Only God is immortal. Say it with me together. Only God is is immortal. Once again, only God is immortal. Let's look at that. Mortal means subject to death. Immortal means imperishable. The Bible never uses immortal soul or the immortality of the soul. In the Bible, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor, glory, forever and ever. Now notice, here is Jesus Christ, the King, the Eternal One. He is the God who will reign forever and ever. And the Bible says that he is what? Immortal. Now notice again, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 and 16, he who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who is the King of Kings? Who is the Lord of Lords? Who is that, everybody? Jesus. But we go on, and it says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light. Notice it says, who alone is immort has immortality. Now look, if I alone have my cell phone, David, come here, please. If I alone have my cell phone, what does it mean? If I alone have my cell phone, what does it mean? It means that David, what? Does he have my cell phone? Does he have my cell phone? No, because I alone have it. If Jesus alone has immortality, do you and I right now have immortality? Do we have that? Why not? Because we are mortal, subject to disease and death. Let me repeat. The Bible uses the term soul, 1,600 times, never once, immortal soul. Only God has immortality. Will God give us immortality one day? When will he give us immortality? When Jesus comes. And so the Bible is, is very clear. Where did the idea of pagan immortality come from? It came from pagan Greek philosophy. Socrates taught that the soul was immortal. Aristotle taught that the soul was immortal.
Plato taught that the soul was immortal, and they had this idea that the immortal soul left the body. Greeks passed it on to the Romans. The Romans, in the days of apostasy, in the Roman church, brought it into the Christian church. And so as the result of that, people are all confused. They worship their dead loved ones because they think that there's some soul going on. And they say, Pastor Mark, uh, they, they do ancestor worship. You know the best way that you can pay tribute to your dead father, mother, sister, brother? You know how you can honor them? By living a godly, righteous life because you keep the name and the honor of the family. You don't honor them by worshiping them as dead souls that live on, but you honor them by living an honest life, by living a righteous life, by being an example in the community, and you honor the family name. Now, the Bible teaches that death is like a sleep. The believer who dies is as secure as if they were sleeping in Jesus. The Bible says our life is hid with Christ in God. So when we die, our true life is hid in God. It's not something that thinks or feels, but God has a record of every single thing about us. And we, when we die, it's like sleeping. It's like resting in the arms of Jesus. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Paul's going to tell us what? A mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound. So death is but a sleep. It's a rest. It's perfect peace. No suffering, no heartache, no sorrow, no pain, no disease. It's just resting, and it's like resting and sleeping in the arms of Jesus. But when Christ comes, he will call your loved one from the grave, that husband that died, that wife that died, that child that died in Christ. The dead will be raised incorruptible with no pain, suffering, heartache, and we shall be changed. When God created Adam, he placed his breath within Adam, not an immortal soul, because the Bible says, God, the Lord God, formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man becomes a living soul or a living being. Now death is creation in reverse. What happens when a person dies? Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 tells us, the dust returns to the earth and the spirit returns to God that gave it. Now here's where many people make a mistake. Many people think that the spirit and the soul are the same thing. They are not. What is the spirit that returns to God? Is that spirit something that thinks and feels? What is it, the spirit? The Bible says God breathed his breath or his spirit into man, and that returns to God. So the spirit and the soul are not the same thing. The spirit and the breath are the same thing. So what returns to God is the life-giving breath that God gave at the beginning. The old, in the Old Testament, there's a Hebrew word for spirit. It is ruach. It also means breath. So what goes back to God is not something that thinks and feels. It is the breath or the spirit of God. The spirit and soul are different. God creates man out of the dust of the ground. God breathes into his nostrils the breath or the spirit of life. When a man dies, the body goes to the dust. That breath or spirit returns to God. The person no longer exists as a living soul. If they're a Christian, they simply rest in peace until Jesus comes. The spirit or breath of life or is the power of life. And that's what returns to God. The Bible teaches that the breath and the spirit are the same thing. We read that in Job 27, verse 3. Now, in the Bible, there's something called parallelism. Often something is stated in the first part of a verse, and it's explained in the second part of the verse. And you find that here. 
Job 27, verse 3. All the while my breath is in me, and what does it say next? The Spirit of God is where? In my nostrils. So according to the Bible, the breath and the Spirit are the same. Does that mean there's no consciousness in death? If a person dies, is there any consciousness in death? When that person dies, um, uh, are they still conscious? Is this spirit that goes back to God something that's conscious? Look, the Bible tells us, Psalm 146, verse 4, his breath goes forth, he returns to the earth, in that very day his thoughts perish. In that very day, what happens, everybody? What happens? His thoughts do what? Perish. His breath or the Spirit of God goes forth, his body goes to the earth, and in that very day his thoughts do what? Perish. Look at Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5 and 6. The living know that they will die, but the dead know what? Not the dead know how much, everybody? Nothing. So if the dead don't know, know nothing, it means that they are, don't have any consciousness Ness. Also, their love, their hatred, their envy has now perished. Well, if the dead died and they went to heaven, their thoughts wouldn't perish. If the dead died and they went to heaven, they wouldn't know nothing, they would know something. If the dead died and they went to heaven, they still would have the ability to love. But God's plan is so much better. Death is a sleep until the second coming of Christ. And the Bible writers declare death as a sleep more than 50 different times. Here's one example from David in the Psalm, Psalm 13. He says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God, enlighten mine eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. You remember when Jesus talked to his disciples and he discussed Lazarus with them. Lazarus had died and Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, I'm going to awake Lazarus out of his sleep. He says, oh friend, Lazarus sleeps, but I'm gonna go to wake him up. What did Jesus' disciples say? They said, Lord, if he sleeps, he's doing well. Another per reason, if a person is sick and they're sleeping, they're doing pretty good. Uh, because they may sleep and the fever may break when they sleep and they may wake up and be much better in the morning. But Jesus then said, however, Jesus spoke of his death, but thought that he was, they thought he was speaking about rest and sleep. And so Jesus had to clarify that. Then Jesus said unto them, Lazarus is dead. If Jesus taught that death was like a sleep, I want to believe the words of Jesus and not some pastor. I want to believe the words of Jesus and not some uh, priest. If Jesus says death is a sleep, how many of you believe it? Just raise your hand and say, I believe Jesus. Let's say it together. I believe Jesus. I believe Jesus. What, did Jesus say that Lazarus was sleeping? Did he say that? did Jesus say that then Lazarus was dead? Now Jesus goes to Martha. Now Martha was one of the closest followers of Jesus. What did Martha believe about death? Did Martha believe that her brother Lazarus was in heaven? So Jesus goes to Martha and Martha says to Jesus in John 11 verse 20, Four and 25, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Did Martha say to Jesus, I know my brother's up in heaven, so although I have a few tears, I'm not worried. Did Martha say that to Jesus? Did Martha learn her, her religion from Jesus? Did she? And what did Martha say? I know that he will rise again in the last day. Jesus was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead to demonstrate that he could resurrect every believer in the last day. So Jesus says to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes on me, though he may die, he shall live. 
so to demonstrate Christ's power over the grave, to do, demonstrate Christ's victory over the tomb. Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. Did Jesus say, Lazarus, come down? Is that what Jesus said? You know, if what some people believe is true, and if I were Lazarus uh, and I was up in heaven for four days and Jesus said, come back, I would have shouted from heaven, Lord, you called the wrong name. I'm up in heaven. I'm not coming down to that world of sickness, suffering, and death. Lord, call somebody else, please. Lord, don't call Lazarus. Call somebody else down here, Lord, because, Lord, I'm not coming back, right? What book did Lazarus write about being up in heaven for four days? Did he write a book that was a bestseller in Jerusalem about what heaven is like? If Lazarus was up in heaven, number one, he never would have wanted to come back. Number two, if Lazarus was up in heaven, if anybody could tell us what heaven was like, if Lazarus was up there, he would have told us what heaven was like, right? What did Lazarus say? Nothing. Why not? Because Lazarus was sleeping. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to demonstrate that he has victory over the grave. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead to demonstrate that if you lost a husband or a wife, if you've lost a son or a daughter, that Jesus Christ has never lost a battle with Satan over death. Death cannot keep our loved ones in the grave because Jesus Christ has victory over the two. Jesus Christ will never, never let us down. He will call our loved ones forth. Now somebody said, but pastor, I like to think of my mother up in heaven praising the Lord. That's what I really like to think about. Look at Psalm 115, verse 17. The Bible says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any that go down into silence. Say that with me. The dead do not praise the Lord. Together? Wherever you are, whatever language you speak, say it with me. The dead do not praise the Lord. Again here, the dead do not praise the Lord. But somebody says, I think that's a wonderful idea. I want you to think about that. God's way is best. Let's suppose here's a mother, and that mother dies. And let's suppose, she does not, but let's suppose what the deception is. Let's suppose somebody believes in that deception. Let's suppose that in that idea, that falsehood, she goes to heaven. But let's suppose she has a son, and her son is in the army. And let's suppose the country is at war. And let's suppose the enemy captures the son. And as they capture that son, they torture him. They gouge out his eyes with a knife. They cut out his tongue. I, I, is mother up there looking down at that? Wouldn't that be the most horrible thing in the world for that mother to see? Or let's suppose here's a mother up in heaven and she looks down and sees her son who's become a drug addict or an alcoholic. And let's suppose there's a son up in heaven and he looks down and he sees his father beating his mother. Jesus' way is so much better. Death is asleep. We don't see the heartache of life. We don't see the trials that our families go through. We don't see the sufferings of poverty, the sufferings of war. We do not see the sufferings of sickness. We don't see somebody going through chemotherapy and, and dying of cancer. Jesus' way is so much better, my brother and sister. We rest. Death is a state of perfect rest, asleep until the day of the resurrection. And Christ wakes us up and all sorrow is over. There is no passage of time. You die. The next thing you know, you look up, and there you see Jesus' face. There's no passage of time. 
You know, my wife and I have been traveling for 56 years in evangelism. In those early years, we always brought our children with us. And when my son was just a baby, sometimes we'd have a little blanket off to a little side room, and my wife would sit with him there, and he would lie on the blanket, and he would see his daddy preach. Well, sometimes he'd fall asleep. And after he had fallen asleep, we lived in the New England states. That's the east coast of America. And it snowed a lot in a state like Massachusetts. It would snow. So sometimes I'd be preaching, and I wouldn't have rain on the roof. It'd be snowing and snowing. And so I would be preaching, and my little boy would fall asleep. It's OK if my three or four or five-year-old son falls asleep when I preach, but you better not fall asleep. But anyway, so he would, he would fall asleep. And at the end of the meeting, I would come and carry him in my arms. My wife and I would put him in my car, and we'd drive home. Sometimes the road would be slippery. The car would be slipping. Sometime a truck would pass us. He'd be sleeping. He didn't know about the ice on the road. He didn't know about the uh, trailer trucks that came down. He didn't know we skidded and, and slid going up the driveway to my house. We carried him, put him in the bed. He slept through the night. The next morning, I would come and wake him up. Son, it's time to get up. He would look up at me. Daddy, are you still preaching? I may preach long, but I don't preach that long. There was no passage of time in sleep for the boy, was there? When you die, rest. Perfect rest. No pain, no suffering. That's why Paul said as an old man, for me to die is gain. Why would it be gain? His work was over. He knew his work was over. His body was racked with pain. He would sleep. Death is an instant. You die, you rest. The next thing you see is the brightness of the glory of Christ's coming. The Bible is very clear. Now, the Bible says clearly that his sons come to honor. Job 14, verse 21. His sons come to honor, and he does not know it. They are brought low, and he does not perceive it. In other words, death is asleep, and we rest. In the book of Job, it also says, when a man dies, he shall never return to his house. One night, I was preaching in the Philippines, and I shared this truth about death, that death is asleep, the dead praise not the Lord, that when a person dies, they never can return to their house again. But the devil can try to masquerade and deceive us. A Filipino army officer was in that meeting, and he went home that night, and there was a terrible, terrible storm. A typhoon hit, thunder, lightning, terrible rain pouring and pouring down. And as he lied on his bed, his wife had died a few years before. And as he was lying on his bed, he saw his wife, this form of his wife, this apparition of his wife. He saw his wife above his bed. She looked more beautiful than she ever looked before. She had this beautiful white robe on, glowing light on. And she, he looked up at her and she said, darling, come and embrace me. And he remembered. The living know that they will die, but the dead know not what? Anything. He remembered the dead will never come to their house again. He remembered that the devil would transfer himself into an angel of light. He told me this story personally. He said, I looked up and I said, you are not my wife. You are an evil angel trying to deceive me in the name of Jesus Christ. Be gone. And he said, in the name of Jesus, this being that looked like an angelic figure turned to a hideous demon and was gone. Do not be deceived by the evil one. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not what, everybody? Anything. The devil tries 
to deceive us because he knows how much we love our dead loved ones. He knows how much we care for our dead loved ones. He knows that Jesus is going to come and there will be a glorious day of returning. But somebody says, but Pastor Mark, 1,600 texts in the Bible, no immortal soul. 53 times in the Bible, death is but asleep. The dead know not anything. The dead praise not the Lord. All these texts. But, 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 yeah. but, 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 pastor, what about the thief on the cross? Didn't Jesus say to him, you'll be with me in paradise? So Jesus is on. Uh, let me answer that question for you. I am so glad that you asked that question. You know, Jesus is hanging on the cross. There are nails through his hands. There's a crown of thorns upon his head. One thief says, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. The other thief looks at him and says, Lord, remember me when you come into paradise. And Jesus looks at him and says, this day I say unto you, you will be with me in paradise. What did Jesus mean by that? This day that I'm dying on the cross. This day that it looks like I can save nobody. This day that it appears everything is over. This day, thief, I'm dying for you. I say to you this day, I promise you this day, that one day you'll be with me in paradise. Look, Christ died on the cross on the sixth day of the week, Friday. Christ rested in the tomb and honored the Sabbath on the seventh day. Christ rose from the dead on the first day, the day we call Sunday. And when Jesus rose from the dead, Mary comes to the tomb. At first, she thinks he's the gardener. And as she comes to the tomb, she's crying. Jesus says, Mary. Nobody could call her name like that. Jesus uh, stands there. Mary runs to cling to his feet and hold him. John chapter 20, verse 15, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turns and says to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, don't miss this, I have not yet ascended to my Father. On Sunday morning, had Christ yet ascended to his Father? Had he ascended on Sunday? Had he ascended on Sunday? He says, I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. If he is ascending on Sunday to the Father to have the assurance that his sacrifice is accepted, if he has not gone to paradise on Friday when he was crucified, how could he have meant to the thief that they would meet there in paradise that day? Impossible, because Jesus didn't go to paradise on Friday. How do we know he didn't go to heaven then? Because he said so. Do you believe the word of Jesus? How many believe the word of Jesus? Yes, sure, the dead know nothing. Jesus rested in the tomb. On Sunday morning, he was resurrected. He ascends to heaven on Sunday. Jesus himself didn't go to paradise on that Sunday. What did Jesus mean to the thief? He meant, in my dying moments, in this moment that it looks like I can save nobody, and in this moment with nails through my hands, crown of thorns on my head. In this moment, I say to you, I assure you, you will be future one day with me in paradise. What did Jesus mean? He assured the thief that as the thief was suffering, one day he could be with him in paradise. He assured the thief that, he would, that Christ was going to ascend, be resurrected and ascend to heaven. And this resurrected Lord will come again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. The Lord himself, the Christ that lived, the Christ that died, the Christ that was resurrected from the dead, the Christ that ascended to heaven, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the, the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. One day, that loved one that died, that baby that died, will be placed in a mother's arms again. 
One day, husbands and wives will embrace again. One of the tragedies that I face as a pastor is to have funerals too often. One night in Los Angeles, I was holding a satellite evangelistic meeting. And there, as I was preaching in Los Angeles every single evening, we had two sessions. And uh, after the first session at 5 o'clock, there'd be a little time between that and the second session. I would go in with our staff, with our media staff, with our sound technicians, and our, and our audiovisual people would eat a little bit of something. And so one night after one of the meetings, I was there and getting a little something to eat to get energy for the next session. And somebody said, where is Eddie, our sound engineer? And I said, I, I think he maybe is tinkering with the sound. He wants to do something. I don't know, though. We better check. I went out with some of our staff, and there was Eddie lying on the floor. We immediately called the paramedics and the ambulances. They came, rushed him to the hospital. I went to the hospital that night after the meeting to be with his wife and family. They thought he was doing fairly well. He had a heart blockage and needed a heart operation. The cardiologist or the heart specialist was going to come the next day. They said, he needs this, but he'll survive through the night. As they were wheeling him into the operating room, they put him on the operating table, and he died of a massive heart attack. His wife called me. I entered the operating room, and there my colleague was lying dead on the table. His wife and son were there. We held hands. In a moment like that, what do you say? At times, there's very little you can say. You can cry like Jesus wept at Lazarus' tomb. But there are two things I could say the presence of God and the promise of God. I assured this woman that in the deepest sorrow of her life, Christ had not left her. I told her that I could not explain or understand why her husband died. A godly Christian man. But I told her that we live in a world of sickness and suffering and pain. And sometimes good people die. Sometimes good people are murdered. Sometimes good children are hit by cars. Sometimes death knocks on our door. And it comes to us very close. And our spirit is crushed. And our life is changed in an instant. But I could, buy, could put my arm around that wife and her son and say the presence of God is going to be with you but because the degree to which you suffer is the degree to which God pours his comfort into your heart I could assure them of the presence of God and I could assure them of the promise of God that one day Christ would come one day she would see her husband again one day they could be caught up in the clouds together if tonight you have lost a loved one, and if tonight your husband has been taken suddenly and there's still a pain in your heart, if the child has died unexpectedly and there's a pain there, I want to assure you that Christ has not forsaken you. I want to assure you tonight that he's with you. He says, I'll never leave you and forsake you. He says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. He says in Isaiah 41, verse 10, fear not, for I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will uphold you with my right hand. Sister, you're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. Brother, you're going to get through this. Christ says, I will strengthen you. Tonight, at this place, there is somebody who's lost a loved one, and you're grieving, and you need strength. And as our team comes to sing, for somebody who's lost a loved one, 
You've lost a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a child, a brother, sister. Somebody who's hurting tonight. There is hope for Africa. There's somebody hurting tonight that I want you to come. Just here and pray and say, God, I need my heart healed tonight. Let's stand together. And as we stand, if you are hurting tonight, if you need your heart healed, just come. Now, as always, there's always people in the audience that are making eternal decisions for baptism. Wherever you are tonight, if you want to make your decision for baptism, you come too. You just come tonight and make your eternal decision. You want to see Christ. You want to live with Christ. Would it not be a shame, son, if when Jesus comes, your mother is resurrected, son, and she's caught up in the sky, and she's looking for you, and you're not there? Wouldn't it be terrible, wife, if your husband is resurrected and you're not there? Wouldn't it be terrible, husband, if your wife is looking for you and you're not there? So tonight, don't hold back. Tonight, don't hold back. If you want to live with Jesus and you've never been baptized, you come. If you need to be rebaptized, you come. Your father, your mother is going to be looking for you in heaven. But tonight, if you have a hurting heart, if you've lost some loved one, and you need healing of the heart, healing of the mind, you just come tonight. And just come to this altar and let Jesus speak to your heart. Brother David, you come and make that appeal tonight. Mamuzi sasa, wakati wakufanya mamuzi sasa. Ikiwa una maumivu na uchungu, ndani ya moyo wako, wito wa kwanza unakuita hapa mbele, uji hapa mbele kwa ajili ya maombi maalum. Kwa yote ambaye anasema kwa kweli, natamani siku ikifika ya ufufuo, nikutane na ndugu yangu na mzazi wangu na mtu ambaye alipotea alifariki natamani nikutane naye katika ufufuo wa uzima tafadhali sogea hapa mbele kwa maombi haya maalum ya kukuweka tayari ili jina lako liandikwe kwenye kitabu kile cha uzima ndapo unahitaji kubatizwa na wewe sogea hapa mbele tayari kwa ajili ya kujitoa inawezekana ulifuta ushirika wako lakini unasema nahitaji kuweka maisha upya na Yesu Njoo hapa mbele, njoo hapa mbele. Unahitaji kubatizwa hata kama ulijitoa wakati uliopita, njoo tena tena na tena. Wherever you are tonight. Popote ulipo usiku wa leo. If you have a hurting heart. Kama una moyo wenye maumivu. Ulimpoteza mpendwa wako. There is hope for Africa. Kuna tumaini kwa Afrika. There is hope for Africa. Kuna tumaini kwa Afrika. Presence of God will strengthen you. Uwepo wa Mungu utakupatia nguvu na uimara. Promise of God will encourage you. Na ahadi za Mungu zitakutia moyo. Come tonight. Jo usiku wa leo. If you want to look forward to baptism. Kama unahitaji kubatizwa, you come tonight. Jo usiku wa leo. Sogea pale ulipo. Heaven's going to be a wonderful place. Bingu itakuwa ni sehemu ya furaha sana ya kushangaza. Because we're going to be there. Kwa kuwa tutakuwa pale. With our loved ones. Tukiwa na wapendwa wetu. You've drifted away. Kama ulitanga mbali. This is time for you to come back. Ni muda wa kurudi sasa. Huu ni muda wa kurudi. Jesus is appealing to you. Yesu anakuita usiku wa leo. Join those that are coming forward here. Hebu jiunge na hawa ambao wanakuja usiku wa leo. Jiunge nao sasa. Jesus Christ. Yesu Kristo will never leave you. Hata kuacha. He'll never forsake you. Na wala hata kufukuza. He will give you the strength. Atakupa nguvu. The strength to be baptized. Atakupa uimara wa kubatizwa. The strength to give up habits. Na atakupatia uimara wa kuacha zile tabia mbaya. And for those of you that sorrow. Na wale wenye uchungu that lost loved ones. Ulipoteza mpendwa wako. He will give you the strength to go on. Atakupa nguvu ya kusonga mbele. The strength never to give up. Ile nguvu ya kuto kukata tamaa. Just come. Jo Forget about this audience. Jo, ujiunge na mkutano huu kwa pamoja. Just come and pray. Jo, kwa ajili ya maombi. Just bow your head here. Tunahitaji hebu tafadhali inamisha kichwa kwa ajili ya maombi sasa. If you've come to be baptized, kama umekuja kwa ajili ya ubatizo, say Jesus. Sema Yesu. 
I'm giving my life to you. Ninatoa maisha yangu kwako. Say Jesus. Sema Yesu. I'm going to need your strength. Ninahitaji nguvu yako. If you've come to be rebaptized. Nika umekuja kwa ajili ya ubatizo. Say Jesus. Sema Yesu. I am yours. Yesu bwana wangu. I drifted away. Nilitanga mbali. But I'm coming back to Lakini you. Lakini sasa. And if you've come tonight. Kama umekuja usiku wa leo. Because there is hurt in your heart. Kwa sababu tu unasikia maumivu moyoni mwako katisha tamaa. Pain in your heart. Uchungu ndani ya moyo. And you need the presence of Christ in you. Na unahitaji uwepo wa Yesu Kristo ndani ya moyo wako. Jesus is yes. a great healer. Yesu anakuita. He not only works physical miracles. Hafanyi tu miujiza inayoonekana. But there's a greater miracle than any physical miracle. Lakini kuna muujiza mkubwa sana kuliko muujiza unaoonekana. And that's the healing of the heart. Na huu ni uponyaji wa moyo. We're going to pray. Tunaenda kuomba sasa. Is there somebody else that wants to come? Je, kuna mtu mwingine ambaye anakuja kabla sijaanza kuomba? Somebody else that wants to make their decision. Je, kuna mtu fulani ambaye anahitaji kufanya maamuzi kabla sijaanza maombi? God bless you. Mungu akubariki. Mungu akubariki. Is there somebody here? Je, kuna mtu fulani anahitaji kuja? Thinking about baptism. Na unawaza unafikiri juu ya ubatizo? thinking about this decision to be rebaptized. Na unafikiri juu ya uamuzi huu wa kubatizwa tena ulirudi nyuma. Pastor pray for me. Unasema mchungaji niombe. Mchungaji niombe. I'm thinking about this. Ninafikiria jambo hili. Is there somebody here? Je, kuna mtu fulani? Needs the healing of the heart. Anahitaji uponyaji wa moyo. Who has not come? Ambaye hajaja hapa bado. You just want to lift your hand. Nyosha mkono wako kama uko unahitaji uponyaji wa moyo lakini hujaja hapa mbele. Uko mahala fulani unasema nahitaji uponyaji wa moyo na maumivu yeah, moyo. Naona mikono ikiwa inanyoshwa kule, naona mikono ikinyoshwa kule. Wale ambao hamjaji hapa mbele, uko kule mbali unasema nahitaji uponyaji wa moyo. Somebody there. Mtu fulani mahali fulani. In Uganda. Pale Uganda. Tanzania. Tanzania. Rwanda. Kule Rwanda. Democratic Congo. Kule Congo. I want to make a special appeal to the Congo. Nafanya wito maalum kwa ajili yako. The Lord's put it on my heart. Bwana anakuita. I want to talk to the Belinga Gomer, the refugee camp. Naongea na watu walio kule katika kambi ya wakimbizi kule Goma. They're in that refugee camp. Kuna kambi ya wakimbizi naongea nao bwana. I'm speaking to you tonight. Ninaongea nanyi kambi ya wakimbizi. God is calling you tonight. Bwana anawaita. In the hurt and pain. Katika mauchungu ulio nao moyoni, uchungu moyoni. He's calling you. Bwana anakuita. Come forward. Ili uje to make a decision for Christ. Kufanya maamuzi kwa ajili ya Kristo. He'll heal your heart. Anaita moyoni mwako. And you have the promise. Na anakupa ahadi that he'll come again. Kwamba atakuja tena. To take you home. Kutuchua mbinguni. Hold that promise close to your heart. Shikilia ile ahadi karibu na moyo wako. Tonight let's pray. Usiku wa leo tunahitaji kuomba sasa. Oh my father. Baba yangu. Our hearts are so full of your love. Mioyo yetu imejawa na upendo. You are the great healer of hearts. Wewe ndiye mponyaji wa moyo. I pray. Ninaomba that the healing balm of Jesus would touch hearts tonight. Ule moyo mguso uponyaji wa Kristo kaguse moyo wa kila mmoja wetu. I pray tonight. Ninaomba usiku wa leo. For somebody who's hurting. Kwa yeyote mwenye maumivu ya moyo. Somebody whose heart is pained yeyote ambaye anaumia ndani ya moyo wao that they would cherish the truth that you will hold them in your arms ya kwamba akashikilia ukweli huu ya kwamba utamshikilia utamshikilia katika moyo wako utamshikilia that you will heal their heart ya kwamba utaponya moyo wake that you will strengthen them to go on ya kwamba utawapa uimara wa kusonga mbele father give them the promise that you'll come again baba uwape ahadi ya kwamba unakuja tena Oh Jesus come soon. Oh Yesu njoo haraka. And Father, Baba, for those that have come for baptism. Wale waliokuja kwa ajili ya ubatizo. Rebaptism. Kwa ajili ya kubatizwa wengine tena. Help them to know. Wasaidie kutambua. That they're children of God. Kwamba wao ni watoto wa Mungu. That you have a purpose for their life. Ya kwamba una makusudi katika maisha yao. To walk through the water. Kuwaingia katika maji. To have sins forgiven. Na dhambi zao zisamehewe. And to be mighty witnesses for you. Na watakuwa mashahidi wakubwa kwa ajili yao. To their family and friends. Kwa familia zao na marafiki zao. So Jesus. Kwa hiyo Yesu. The one that said I'll be with you always. Na yule ambaye atasema atakuwa nawe siku zote. Even to the end of the age. Hadi mwisho wa wakati. To that one. 
kwa huyo we give praise tunakutukuza and honor na heshima and worship na tunakuabudu forever milele in jesus name kwa jina la yesu amen amen don't miss tomorrow night usikose kesho when life is new maisha yanapokuwa mapya how to have a new life in christ unapokuwa na maisha mapya katika kristo now pastors you can talk to those who have come forward for baptism wachungaji muendelee kuwahudumia hao ambao wamekuja wote waliojitoa hapa mbele naomba mwelekee upande